I'm Liza Loop, um, and I generally have tried not to be front and center on this stage because I stand on the shoulders of a lot of wonderful giants starting my timer, so I have something to look at here. Um, I stand on the shoulder of, a, of lots of people who know a whole lot more and have done a whole lot more that's important in the whole area of computers and education. But I've found that people enjoy personal stories, and so I end up talking about myself a lot more than I'd like to. So I hope you'll help me make sure that we talk about things that you're interested in, not just things that I'm interested in. Um, our title is How the Personal Computer Changed Teaching and Learning. That was a title that I put together two years ago for the address I gave to the Vintage Computer Festival in Rome in, nine, not 19, 2020, 2019, there we go. Um, and I started trying to put this together. Um, I, I just said, well, let's just use the same title. And then I started trying to put together the talk and modify it and came to the conclusion that it's old news. Um, I'm just looking to see whether you can see on, on these slides, which will be available online, are the URLs to get to the YouTube of that talk, if you want to see that talk, and the slides which are on LinkedIn. So I'm not going to try and reproduce what I did two years ago. I couldn't do it if I tried. Um, I'm going to sort of talk about a bunch of random things, and I'm going to ask you to push me in the directions that you want me to talk about. A lot of this will just be ad lib. I have 50 slides here. We obviously can't use that many slides, but I'll try and illustrate as is appropriate as we talk together. What I do want to say is say a few words about the personal computer and its impact. Um, I use it as a symbol for change, rather than saying very literally, this is how it changed education. I'm really disappointed that education has not changed anywhere near as much as we used to envision that it would change. So it's a symbol, and it's an agent for change. Um, not yet as much of an agent as I'd like it to be. So we'll talk about that a little bit, I think. But we should also look at what actually has changed and why we can do things in education today, even though we're often not doing them, but we can do them that we couldn't do many, many years ago. So what's changed? The amount of data storage has changed. We can now deliver whole books, MOOCs, um, all kinds of educational support materials, and any kind of support materials, as you know, online to anybody, anywhere, if they have internet access and, um, and a smartphone. 40, 50 years ago, we didn't have that. We could imagine that we would have that, but we didn't. Um, our communications infrastructure has changed radically, so it's always been cheaper to move bits than it is to move people. People are big. People have to have careful environments. So the, the idea that we would give a lecture and you would move all the people into one room because books were scarce, that's been turned on its head. We can communicate the information and deliver it to people wherever they are, wherever they have their phone in their hand now. Um, the input-output devices have changed tremendously. We have wearables, we have smartphones, we have all kinds of devices that we can attach to that communications infrastructure. Again, these are changing our access to information, our access to other people, our access to how to do it, descriptions of skills, sometimes our access to the actual tools that we use as we develop our skills and our knowledge. Family structures have changed, as anybody who's lived through COVID knows, and we all have, but anybody who has kids knows that suddenly the main function of school, which has been to babysit, uh, was interrupted. Um, our work has changed. We can work from home. Um, 
and we haven't uh, taken advantage of that. The, the whole structure of how we deliver teaching and learning um, hasn't really stepped up to the plate yet. But the family structures have changed. Our travel pa patterns have changed. We can go places. We can, um, not, not in COVID times, but most of the time, kids, kids young learners can travel much more. Um, and if we want to learn how to fish, we can go to a fishing hole in a way that we couldn't do 50 years ago as easily. And I think the most important change that's happened is our expectation that things will change. So today we know that tomorrow's user interface is going to be different than today's and we're going to have to learn it all over again, um, which I hate, but we have to adjust to expect change. Teaching has often been the transmission of the previous generation's culture to the next generation. That isn't working the same way. And so if we think of one of the impacts of personal computing, it has to do with the fact that the personal computer is a symbol for this kind of expectation that things are going to change, they're going to continue to change, the interface is going to change, the keystrokes are going to change, and you better be prepared to do that. So of course we've been saying you have to learn how to learn, but we're dealing with that even every day when there's a, an upgrade to the operating system on your phone. So this knowing what to say next, knowing what to say to a given audience um, has been a problem for a long time. I gave the first talk at the first West Coast Computer Fair uh, in 1977. And the first problem was that we had no idea that we would have the audience that, uh, that actually showed up. And they were not prepared to register people uh, at speed. So most of my audience was standing on the sidewalk outside Moscow Center in San Francisco, uh, rather than in the room. And I had prepared a formal talk. Um, and I thought that I was going to be speaking to computer hobbyists who knew more than I did about computers. Uh, and so my talk was called Sharing Your Computer Hobby with the Kids. So I'm going to just read this to you. I don't know if you can read it or not. Computer hobbyists are accomplished learners. We've bootstrapped ourselves into a position of expertise in the field of electronic computers. We have technical know-how, and we have equipment. Many of us share our enthusiasm with our own kids and a few neighbors. But what about the rest of the kids whose parents aren't computer freaks? This is 1977. Many of them would get a kick out of hobby computing, too. As you probably know, kids of all ages take to keyboards and controllers like the proverbial, proverbial ducks take to water. They seem to know instinctively that their job at this point in their lives is to master the tools of their society. The way things are going, every home, office, and plant will make use of these electronic tools in the near future. OK, at that time, if you were not a hobbyist but an ordinary member of the public and you wanted to uh, get, get your hands on a computer, these are the places you could do it. Four places on the West Coast, People's Computer Company in Menlo Park, started by Bob Albrecht. And we can talk more about Bob if you'd like. Uh, Loop Center in Katati, which I started modeling after Bob's center. Uh, I started in 75. Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley. I don't know when they started, but you could um, walk into Lawrence Hall and get on a Decision 2000 system, play computer games or program. Um, and you could also phone in if you had a conditioned phone line and a modem and some sort of terminal. Uh, Oregon, a museum of science and industry, which, by the way, has forgotten its own history as this museum has forgotten its own history. And if you walk into the Oregon Science of Museum, uh, Oregon Museum of Science and Industry today, they don't know, their staff doesn't know that they were pioneers in this area. Um, I put Boston Children's Museum on there because that was the only other place I knew of in the country in 1975, 6, 7, where anybody could, could walk in and get their hands on a computer. Of course, kids were infiltrating universities and businesses that had computers, and teachers were pirating time on computers all the time. But there weren't any in schools, uh, except for the administration. So 
skip forward to today and one in six, one, six in 10 people around the world now use the internet. That's change, it's not personal computer change, but it's a major change in the environment in which we both teach and learn. So I wanna go on just a little bit with sharing my computer hobby with the kids, sharing your computer hobby with the kids. Um, because instead of having a, a room full of computer hobbyists, um, what I had was a room full of teachers. Unfortunately, I thought, and I wrote in my paper, which I had to just throw out because <laughs> I couldn't use it for the, the audience I had. Um, unfortunately, few school teachers or scout leaders, and this is wrong because the picture here is a picture of Scout Handbook from 1973, which was five years before this talk was given. So I was wrong. Um, scout leaders have either, few have either the know-how or the equipment to allow their charges to access computers. Many teachers can't even allow access to the most exciting kind of learning, that which grows out of their own curiosity, searching, reading, experimenting, building, and sharing. So teachers are often, in, in any formal education, stuck to the curriculum and have a lot of trouble getting to what the individuals want to learn. You, I thought I was talking to hobbyists, and your homebrew computers are the key for hundreds of kids to discover the same joys and agonies that you yourself have gained from your involvement with your computer hobby. This was not the audience I was talking to, although this may be the audience I'm talking to today. So this is part of why I had a real problem trying to figure out what to put together in this talk. Okay, I have a question. Yes. I, I have the microphone, so I could just ask one. So did you immediately drop that and just go off the cuff, or did you continue on and just, you know, I, muscled through it and realized that some of it's gonna go over their, the, these teachers' heads because they really weren't familiar with the topic and came more out of interest. I, would I dropped it, I dropped it entirely. That's, that's what's, what I just read to you is what's published in that book in the proceedings of the, of the conference. And it, I have no idea what I said. I talked to them about teaching what we used in Loop Center, which was my public access computer center in Sonoma County what we used for teaching, what we took into schools, what we used in field trips when those kids came out of schools, what adults wanted to learn about, what parents, what kinds of things parents had fear of. And of course, um, one of the things I learned from Bob Albrecht, who had People's Computer Company and also worked in schools, was that teachers were terrified of computers. They had some strange idea that computers might replace them and plus they were afraid they would break them and they were afraid the kids would learn more than they would and they were afraid they would look like fools if they let the computers into the classroom. So one of Bob's secrets, which I'm sure I shared at that time, was that um, you put the computer in the teacher's lounge. You don't put it in the classroom. So the teachers could learn to use it by themselves and in privacy without losing face in front of their students. And that actually was a, a, a foot in the doorway to get computers into schools. That's changed. Kids have computers at home. Teachers have computers at home. We have a totally different um, approach to how to go about teaching in formal situations. Did that respond to your question? Yes, it did. OK. Um, so we can go on today. We can talk about what's educational uh, technologies impact on teaching and learning. I can be very formal if you want. Um, I can stand up here and tell personal stories. I've been telling personal stories for two days now sitting at the booth and many of you have already heard several of them. But I've got a list of personal stories that I've got some illustrations for if we want to go that way. I also want to make sure that I save enough time to uh, say something about the project that I'm working on going forward now, which is Kepler. And Kepler stands for uh, Knowledge-Based Environment for Personalized Learning Using an Artificial Intelligence Recommender. And it's a tool and a support system for independent learners. So um, Matt is gonna wave her hand at me, so I need, need to have at least 15 minutes at the end, unless you guys 
want to. I can keep you to time on that if you want. Okay. To. Okay. I need I need some time to make sure that we we talk a little bit about Kepler at the end. Oh, but I, if it we sounds get, really interesting. So okay. I want to. And and we can talk about it now. If 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 you guys all say, oh, let's talk about that now. Skip the rest of the stuff. I'm perfectly happy to do that. Or. Uh, let's see, what are the other things I said I would talk well, about? Well, you said you'd tell stories. We're, we're all story people, right? That's, I think, why we're all here, is to hear some good stories. Okay. And then I'll make sure that I let you know so we can talk about Kepler. Okay, cool. So, these are the ones I'm prepared to, to, to talk about. And not only that, you can ask me anything. If I don't want to talk about it, I'll tell you. Um, but, of course, we want to talk about the Apple One, was the homebrew. I've told this story several times so far, and I'm perfectly happy to tell it again, and as many times as, as it's of interest to whoever's out there listening. Um, I can talk about Loop Center, how we got it started, why we started it, what we did. Um, it was open, it was a public access computer center open for three years. Um, and then I ran it out of my home, and I'm still running it out of my home. Um, we can talk about, I skipped Bob, Bob Albrecht is one of those giants on whose shoulders I stand. I think Bob is still alive, he's in his 90s now. I last saw him here about 10, at the 30th anniversary for, um, for the Apple, and he was grabbing me by the arm and saying, Liza, Liza, I'm 84, can you believe that? Uh, and yeah, I can believe it. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's another really good Lots of stories. Um, I can talk about how we're building the um, history of computing and learning in education virtual museum. And I can talk about Kepler. And anything else that I know about, I'm perfectly happy to stand up here and blab about. Um, so do you guys want to choose one of these that you'd like to hear first? I think we should probably start at the top and then see how, see how we can go before we have to get to uh, Kepler. Right. Anybody want to argue with anyone, him? Anyone, anyone disagree? He, now, do, he doesn't get to be the authority. All the heads. So we have people shaking yes. Okay. You, you we want the homebrew story. Yeah. Okay. We love homebrew story. Homebrew story. Homebrew story. Okay. So it starts a little bit with Loop Center, um, and uh, so I, I, mm, let's see. Where do I want to start this? Um, which slide is showing? Oh, that one, personal stories, come on. Okay. Um, I started, I didn't know anything in 19, in 1972, I decided I was gonna start a personal, uh, public access computer center. And um, the guy that got me started was a guy named Dean Brown, who was then at SRI doing research on computers in education. And he was co-teaching a Montessori class. And he had a teletype attached to Lawrence Hall of Science in the Montessori School of Maria Montessori of the Golden Gate in San Francisco. And he um, was teaching five, six, and seven-year-olds to program their Montessori lessons in the pilot language, which is a script processing, a text processing language. I spent five minutes in the room with Dean, said, that's my career, that's where I'm gonna go. My first son was, uh, this was January of 72, he was born in September of 71. And I knew that I was gonna have to pay attention to education, because if he didn't make trouble for himself in school, I'd make trouble for him. And I was right. Um, so Dean took me down to SRI, I met people there, and he was, I think maybe he was on the board of People's Computer Company at that time. So he took me to a People's Computer Company um, board meeting and I met the folks there and saw how that operated and said, oh goody, I have a model for what I wanna do. I didn't wanna do exactly the same thing, but a lot of the same things that he did. Um, so one of the things, but I didn't know anything about computers, <laughs> except I knew how to program in pilot language, which is a very simple language. It took about a half an hour to learn that. Um, so I started the Sonoma County Computer Club because I figured that was the way to get a bunch of techies who would tell me how to do what I needed to do. Um, so I started this, the Sonoma County Computer Club. We met once a month. Um, one guy was able to, let's see, Dean brought me a data point terminal, which we could put in, in our computer center. Another of the computer club members um, got a 
Mitz Altair, like he ordered it the day that it came out in 1975 and got it in three or four weeks and built it over a weekend, played with it all he wanted and put it in our computer center. We had a terminal to call computer, we had a terminal to Lawrence Hall of Science. So we were up and running very quickly. The computer club folks started going to Homebrew Computer Club and they finally came to me and said, Liza, you've got to go down and see these folks. So I said, ho-hum, it's a long way, it's 100 miles, and yeah, I'll go down with you. So I went to, I think probably I went to one homebrew computer club meeting and said, mm, that's okay, that's interesting. And I think it was probably the second one, but don't sue me if I'm wrong, that I went to. And I got up in the sharing section and said, mm, I'm taking computers into schools and I'm looking for help and ideas and people who know more about computers than I do and people who will talk to me about what I might want to teach kids and share with the kids. Um, I had plenty of my own ideas, but I wanted more. And there was this guy out in the corridor typing away on his keyboard and it was Steve Wozniak. He came in for the sharing session and as soon as it got over, he came up to me and said, I'm building this computer because I want it to be used in education and you're the only person I've ever met who was taking computers into schools. If I gave you one of these things, would you take it into schools? And I said, of course. And he said, well, it's not ready yet, so I'll let you know when I got it ready. So a couple of months later, I get a call from him and he wants to come up and see me. So it's like, computer club meeting is, Next week, why don't you come on up? Which he did, and he had that in his car. And we've got conflicting stories. He says Jobs was with him, I say Jobs wasn't. But then I didn't like Steve Jobs very much, so <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know which of us is right. I don't remember Jobs participating much, but what I do know is that Steve Wozniak said that when he announced to, to Steve Jobs that he wanted to give me the first computer off the assembly line, Jobs made him buy it. So this machine was sold, but it was sold to Steve Wozniak. And then it was donated to Loop Center. And Woz is not an institutional kind of guy, so I don't think he cared whether he gave it to me or Loop Center. He just cared that it got taken into schools, which it did. Um, so he shows up, he's got a flat brown box, which I refer to as a pizza box, and I don't know whether it was a real pizza box or just a flat brown box. Uh, and I don't know what happened to the box. I think it disintegrated over the years. Um, and he opened it up and said, tra -la, here's the box. That's not literal, but effectively that's what happened. And uh, I said, well, thank you very much, but what do I do with it? Because <laughs> it's just, just a, a naked board. Um, so he said, oh, well, you build a power supply and you build a box and you go buy a keyboard and uh, you plug them all together and the, here's, the, um, here's where you plug the keyboard in and, and here's where you plug this card in, which is a cassette interface and you get any old cassette and here's the cartridge that has the basic language in it. And oh, by the way, there's a pot here, little screw turny thing on the board and you have to fiddle with the pot and fiddle with the volume and the tone on the um, tape recorder because only, if somebody's back there nodding, only the right combination of those three adjustments will make the noise on the audio tape readable by the computer so that it will load basic language. And as I found out, it takes 20 minutes to load basic language. And at the end of that time, you find out whether it was successful or not. OK, so our expectation, I said, thank you very much. Uh, and one of the computer club members built a case. Another one built a power supply. Um, and I got invited to take it into Windsor Junior High School. Let's see, I think, I think this next slide's just say, here's what you're supposed to talk about. Personal stories, come here. Oh, that's not it. That's it. Um, Windsor Junior High School. I'm on track. Uh, <laughs> so 
Um, and I can't remember, I will find out who the teacher was that invited me to come. It was a math class in the junior high school. Couldn't get into the room until the previous class got out, which meant that I couldn't plug the computer in and the tape recorder in until I got into the classroom, which was at the time the class was supposed to start. At that point, I could start loading BASIC. It took 20 minutes to load BASIC. Maybe it would load, maybe it wouldn't. If it didn't, it would take another 20 minutes to try and load it again, at which time the class was over. So as you can imagine, this is not the ideal um, set of equipment to use to teach programming with. So some of the time, some of the classes that I came into, and I'm a guest lecturer, a guest speaker in the class, um, were successful. And I could teach, I, I'd explain what I was doing, start it loading, um, and show kids how to do a hello world or a uh, hello my name is so and so, what's yours program in basic. And by the time we'd done that and the kids had written out their program that they wanted to key in, if basic loaded, then one kid could type in, because they usually weren't very good typists, a three or four line program, and computer, please don't do that. Um, and then we get to run the program. If we were really lucky, we'd get to run two kids' programs. Um, if we were not lucky, the computer would crash, and we'd have to do something else. So I called Waz back, and I said, you know, I really like the idea of this, you know, having this little computer we can take into classrooms and I support what you're trying to do, but this machine won't do it. And he said, oh, send it back to me, bring it back to me, and I'll fix it. So I did, took it back to him, he worked on it. Three weeks later, I call him up and say, hmm, you know, where's my computer? Oh, I'm working on it, it's not ready yet. Three weeks later, I call back, where's my computer? Well, you know, it's still, still not working right. Actually, I think it, it came back the second time, and it still didn't work, and I took it back to him again. So third time's a charm, right? He says, don't worry about it. I've got something else for you. And I say, ho-hum, what's that? And a few weeks later, he shows up with Apple II number 10 and says, which he pulled off the assembly line. I don't think Jobs made him buy that one. Um, and so he pulled it off. He, 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 I, he said, just unscrew the Apple I out of the box that you've got, screw the Apple II in in place, plug everything in the same way, and it'll work a whole lot better, which it did. Um, so that's how I got the Apple I. I had no idea that it was important, valuable, gonna become, ta-da, a showpiece. Um, so the second part to this story is it, it did, come on, get the right place, Liza. Um, it did become an interesting item. I didn't know that it was so important until I got a call from the History's Lost and Found TV program saying, we understand you have the first apple, where is it? Oh, I think it's on some shelf in the basement somewhere. <laughs> um, we had a big Victorian house in Palo Alto, a small Victorian house, a big house for us, um, with an old dirt floor basement and a bunch of storage shelves. And if we could find the tape of this sh um, History's Lost and Found show, and I haven't, I, I used to have a copy of it, but it's, it's in among probably the hundred banker boxes worth of stuff I have in Loop Center's collection, um, if I have it at all anymore, and if it's readable. Um, but it shows the camera, Waz came to the house, and we, they interviewed us for probably two hours, of which we got a 10 minute slot, or an eight minute slot on, on but on national TV. And they showed, excerpts from the interview and walking down the creaky old basement stairs and wandering through the basement to find the metal shelves that the apple's just sitting there on. After that, I uh, took better care of it. Um, and now, it's a huge problem because nobody knows how to insure it. It's so valuable 
that we don't know what to do with it. And I live in fire country in Guerneville. The fire last year came within a mile and a half of my house. In 2017, the HP archive, which was in Santa Rosa, burnt down in that fire. So this is a, it, it, when the fires started again last year, I called up the Computer History Museum and said, please, please, would you store this for me until fire season is over? Because I have no place to put it. I imagined putting it in, in, a, in a wine locker. But other than that, I have no place to put it and to keep it safe. So I will mention they fit perfectly in a legal size um, safety deposit box. That's just the box. Ask me how I know. <laughs> That's, that's just the, uh, unfortunately, Santa Rosa doesn't have any of those. Uh, they, do have, they do have wine storage places, though, so I could, I could hire one of those. Anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna, it's going to be in a safe place, um, but I think it's a funny story. Um, so that's, that's the Apple one. Does anybody have questions that you'd like to ask about it? I will continue to show it. I haven't shown it much because I haven't been able to show it securely in the past, but we're getting there. Somebody's waving their hand. Yeah. So um, there's been a strong libertarian bent in the um, original Homebrew Computer Club and the Homebrew Robotics Club that has taken over the, the mandate. And I'm wondering if this is um, something that is not conducive to societal progress when it's reflected in, for example, Wikipedia, where a lot of the economics editors have followed um, Wikipedia co-founder Jimmy Wales, who's a very, uh, who was a very strident objectivist. And do you think that um, the tendency of uh, educational software developers to realize that they have an easy avenue towards avoiding taxes doesn't have the kind of positive impacts on society that a different attitude might? That's a huge question. Um, and, and I kind of want to turn it on its head and say, shouldn't we be asking this about Bitcoin? Um, I, I think in the, in the computing industry, in the innovation industries in general, in the computing industry in, in particular, um, Lots and lots of independent, make your own way, go your own people who don't like paying taxes. Uh, every kind of political stripe there is, but united in we're independent, we want to do things our own way. Even the IBMers took off their ties on occasion. Um, and the garters on their socks. <laughs> yes. Uh, at Atari, uh, there has, was a hot tub in the basement um, and a lot of other things going on. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of duck that one. I, I can say that what I'm trying to do now is encourage people to look uh, from a systems point of view at all the systems in their lives, including the economic systems. And we're beginning to do that a lot more. Um, I used to say that, that teaching programming and computing and computer literacy took the place today, programming especially, that historically was taken by Latin. We used to say that you needed to study Latin because you needed how to learn how to think and learn, needed to understand how a linguistic system fit together. Um, and um, when I was doing most of my teaching, we always taught at least rudimentary basic or a rudimentary programming language of some kind partly because we wanted people to be inoculated against thinking that the computer could tell people what to do, thinking that the computer told people anything, rather than thinking of it as a delivery mechanism for what people said. We wanted people to understand garbage in, garbage out. Uh, I was talking to a young person a couple of days ago and said, have you ever heard of Gigo or garbage in, garbage out? No, no idea. And I said, well, how about fake news? Fake news, they understood. So thinking for yourself, understanding how to problem solve, understanding how parts of a system fit together, 
understanding that you can make a machine say almost anything and it doesn't make it true. These are some of the things that we need to be teaching when we work with computers in education. I think it's a travesty that we're delivering personal computing today with no programming languages. There's no basic, there's no pilot, there's no, you can get them online, but you can't always stay online all the time. I think that it would be really valuable. We, we in the past, and maybe I'm just being an old fart saying, well, the past was better than the present. I don't think the past was better than the present. But some of the things that are sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater is we're not delivering our machines with programming languages. We're not encouraging people to learn programming. It has to be a, you know, code, code today, the day of, national day of code has to be a big deal instead of, well, of course you have to learn to code if you're gonna work with a computer. Um, so all of that will support some people will come down libertari libertarian, some people will come down conservative, some people will come down liberal or progressive. Um, but teaching people to think for themselves and not think that the machine is somehow initiating thought is really important. One of the things that, that, that drives me nuts when I listen to NPR, which I do often, is they say sometimes, Ask your smart speaker to say NP, to play NPR. And every time I make a fist and say, no, tell your smart speaker to play NPR. I don't want to ask it to play anything that some programmer someplace else told it to do. I want me and everybody else that's using these machines to keep the humans in charge. So that's, that's my best response to that one. We have a question? Yeah. A question for you. So uh, you were a pioneer introducing computers to classrooms, one yes. of the first. What changes did you notice in the students when you do that, something that's lasting because of your introduction to the computer? And is there an equivalent thing happening today where a similar change is happening in the students' minds? Need to take at least 10 seconds to think about that. Um, couple of changes happening. Um, when I taught, I always taught what I called computer literacy, which had several different components to it. Programming, how to operate the computer, how to turn it on and turn it off, and to recognize that it is a system the way a stereo system was a system, not a black box. Um, that was one of the things that I tried to, to make sure that whoever I was teaching, child or adult, got the message. I had kids who asked me, how did the little person get into the television set? When you've got people who are that ignorant and don't realize how the messages that they're receiving every day happen, you have a prescription for long-term tyranny. Um, and I'm a pro progressive. I'm against long-term tyranny. So teaching to understand systems and how they work and that they are comprehensible. Um, we're not doing that today. We're delivering closed box systems that are so programmed that um, you can do some things, but you can't, there, there are a lot of things that you don't learn how to do. Um, we taught programming. Um, so that, um, again, that inoculated people, even if all you did was, uh, what, I, what I always did was ask whoever, children or adults, to write a program which said an untruth so that they knew that it, <laughs> the message was not the medium, it was what some person put into the medium. Um, and so often, and what happens today is um, you'll still get uh, the, the customer support person telling you when you call your bank, I can't do that because the computer won't let me. No, the computer doesn't make those rules. The computer programmer makes those rules. And today, the computer programmer is probably implementing something that somebody else told them to implement. So again, understanding this system of how things get delivered to the individual 
is one of the most important things we can teach, and we're not doing it. Um, so that leads you to also understanding what kinds of careers there are, kinds of work that you can do related to technology, because we have this huge hype that says, oh, we'll have plenty of jobs because we need people to work in technology. And they don't think about the fact of, well, you know, IQ is a norm reference test. So 50% of the people have an IQ of 100 or less. And if you go to any of these high-tech people and say, well, would you hire somebody who has an IQ of 95? Our new jobs, unless it's a janitor, a low-pairing kind of job, are cutting out 50% of the population. This is a travesty. We're going to have to deal with this. Uh, so again, this gets us on the edge of political stuff. Um, the personal computer 40 years ago 30 years ago, was a completely different animal than the personal computer today. And I think we've gone in the wrong direction, which is part of why I want to talk about some other directions that we could go in. OK, so we have, sorry, are you, yeah, we have ahead. one more question. And then we have to talk about Kepler, or you will get in trouble. I'll get myself in trouble, right. OK. Well, I, I completely agree with your, your notion about inoculating people and making them understand how things work because that essentially alerts them that there's more to it than they think. Those probably aren't, though, all the skills that they need to be able to deal with the world as, it, as it's coming in through their computer. And do uh, you have thoughts about that? What, what are the other skills? And, and that probably, I, I signaled him I want to answer a question yeah. before you mentioned about the the, the half of the population, but it, it touches on that too, I think. Yeah, I mean, if you read a lot of the literature on the future of work, it's like, oh, well, we have to learn, we have to learn STEM and STEAM. I think we have to learn um, to live lives of high self-esteem and, and high, dignity without employment. Uh, and again, this is my personal point of view. So you got me up here, you get my personal point of view. Um, we are automating so much, including programming. So um, Tim O'Reilly, I went to a talk that Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Media gave, and he said, we're not going to do programming in the future. We're going to manage programs that program. Um, so even something which was high skilled, I mean, we're, we're trying to teach kids, people to code today, and we may not have to code in the future. It may be, it may be automated. Um, so learning, learning how to fulfill oneself, become self-actualized, we, we've got a bifurcated society at this point. We've got folks who are dealing with how do I survive how, how do I live in a way that I'm not worried about food, shelter, clothing, housing, medicine for myself and my family in the next week? There are billions of people that are living on that level. Then we have the sort of people who are in standard employed middle class lives and live the way we lived 50 years ago. And then we have another class of people who um, are never going to be gainfully employed who still need to live, live happy, healthy li self, lives of self-esteem. And for those people, we have to teach them something different. We, and we don't know who's going to turn out to be whom. We need to learn that enough is sometimes enough, that, we don't, that competition isn't the only possible goal, that we don't have to be the richest, that, we don't have, that, that there's no shame in being a nomad. It's like. Human beings have been nomads for most of humanity's existence. Why suddenly do we have, uh, you should be shamed if you don't have a permanent address. <laughs> That's a relatively new phenomenon. So there's a, there's a huge amount to your question. I would love to carry on this dialogue. Um, I have a blog called um, Meta blog, which is new economic thinking action analysis and action. But if you type in Meta blog into Google, you'll get it. Um, 
And that's, uh, that's a place where I'm real interested in discussing. Because these, ekos means home, it doesn't mean money. And uh, so economics is the study of how we operate our homes. You uh, work the Latin in there, I like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, three years. <laughs> um, was that good enough? Do you wanna, okay, okay. Okay, great, so can you tell us about, uh, I guess your latest um, project, Kepler? Kepler, Kepler, okay. So I found in some of the stuff I had at the booth, I didn't ever put what Kepler was for. What, it, what Kepler means. Uh, and it means knowledge-based environment for personalized learning using an artificial intelligence recommender. If we start at the back end, a recommender is not an authority. It is not somebody who tells you you have to study this because it'll be good for you. It's something that says, oh, maybe you'll like this. We recommend it. Um, so what I want to build is an environment, a, a platform that recommends we can use the name Kepler as thinking of it as the wizard who says, well, what do you want to learn today? And you say, I'd like to learn about rocks. And so Kepler says, uh, gee, um, uh, okay, I can find some stuff for you to play with about rocks, um, but to find the right stuff, I need to know a little more about yourself. So what happens is there are, there are four nodes that we have to really understand to build Kepler. Kepler at this point is vaporware. It's an idea in my head. There are five of us on the team working on this. One of the guys is an AI professor in southern Italy whom I met in Rome two years ago who approached me after I gave the other talk and said, I'd like to do this, you want to do it with me. So I've spent the last 18 months working with him and the rest of the team working on this. We're still a long way from, from from implementing anything, but we've got a lot more ideas than we did. So there's four nodes that, that are the, three of them are the knowledge bases. Um, the, the yellow one is understanding what the person, what their learning goals are, what they are interested in, what they wanna learn about. Sometimes it's a very convergent goal, like I wanna get a driver's license or a law degree, or I wanna become an astronaut. Uh, sometimes it's a very fuzzy, um, divergent goal, like I'd want to learn about rocks, or maybe even, uh, I don't know what I want to learn about today, give me something that'll be fun. Um, now, that's a really difficult assignment for an AI, so of course the first impl implementation will not be able to be that flexible. My job is vision keeper, my job is to say, this is what we'd like to build, and then work down from the ideal to the practical. Um, so goals, int what, what the learner is interested in, and a pathway to get there is one of the knowledge bases that we need to work with. So Kepler says, but I need to know something about yourself. So the second one, the green one, is the learner profile, and Kepler needs to, Kepler and the learner together build as detailed a learner profile as we can. The learner profile belongs to the learner. It is not something that belongs to a school or a parent or some other authority. The learner gets to keep their profile and what they've put in their profile private and release it as they choose. That, uh, when I talk about this with a lot of people, their first question is, oh, you can't do that because it'll violate everybody's privacy. No, we're gonna deal with privacy right up front. Um, so profile is a combination of demographic information, who you are, what your name is, how to reach you. Um, it's what you already know, your transcript, your skills, everything you've mastered, all your micro badges. Um, and it's your preferences. It's like, I like to look at orange letters on black. Or no, I like to, um, to work in small groups face to face. Or no, I like to study and really learn a whole lot about the subject I'm working with, and then I like to get together with a small group. So all of that kind of information becomes part of the profile, which is much more detailed than anybody's doing today. But in order to do personalized recommending, we need to have that really deep information. The third thing, the purple circle, or the purple corner of the tetrahedron, is um, 
the environment. We're physical beings. We live and learn in physical environments, emotional environments, social environments, and digital environments. Some things can be delivered in one environment. Some things can be delivered in another environment. So we need to combine both what can be delivered there and um, what, uh, what the person prefers. With those three sets of data, the AI can go out and search the web for either um, in-person experiences. So why don't you go take an in-person class on this? Uh, why don't you read this book? Why don't you watch this videotape? Why don't you go see if you can um, arrange a meeting with this person who knows a lot about what you're interested in? Why don't you get on social media and form a group to study, to, to go on field trips and take roadside geology and look at the rocks in your neighborhood? Um, so each learner gets maybe five recommendations of things to try. Not you must do, but things to try. And you try them out, and you say, well, I like this one, and that one, maybe next year it's too complicated for me now, and that one's not really on task, and I really like that one. And so Kepler will learn and get better. Um, one of the things that, that we're talking about doing is changing from the model where the teacher controls everything and the goals get filtered through the teacher. The goal of the teacher says, you got to learn poly polynomials this week. Um, the resources get filtered through the teacher. And the teacher either gives the, uh, the learner the resources and says, do this workbook, do this, fill out this sheet, or gives a lecture. And the locus of control is in current, the way we imagine current day education is with the teacher, often not the learner. Yes. In Maryland, the teachers in the public schools have almost no autonomy and can't adjust. Okay. Based on. Actually, most schools, I think, today have that uh, where they can't adjust their curriculum anymore. That's sort of, as many teachers I know have said, they're teaching to the mandates and the tests. They're not teaching what they need to teach. Okay. So, so let's not make the teacher the bad guy here. Oh, no, it's not. It's, they're told this is your curriculum, this is what you must teach, and you're going to teach for this test, and that's so our numbers look good. Yeah, and, and so, so the, the, reason, the only reason the teachers, in, it's not because these people don't have good intentions, it's because that curriculum is being filtered through the teacher is why I drew this this way. I'll, tr I'll redraw this slide so it doesn't do that. Thank you. Um, but what I really want to do is move the role of the teacher where the teacher becomes a resource to the students instead of the, um, the agent of authority. And so the authority, the more we can move the authority to the learner, um, I think the better we'll go. This is structurally more, I think, of how special education works today, Speci not how the regular normal children are taught, but with, when you move into the world of the special education teachers, they're given a lot of autonomy because of the known requirements of the student, which then reflect back to the teacher what the teacher has to do. So um, just, you know, just, just so you're aware, like yeah. that it, ma it maps perfectly to what they're teaching and we telling can, them. We can tie that back again to how computing has changed, because if you look at the history of computing in education. It started with special education. Started in a deaf school in Berkeley was one of the very earliest uh, areas where the kids got access to computing. They couldn't teach them in many of the normal ways, so they had to be innovative. So I can close with the idea that we need to keep these devices as stimulus for innovation, for finding new ways and better ways of doing things, instead of using them as devices to simulate the same old way of teaching that we did in the past and resisting change. <laughs>